There are few things more rewarding than belonging to a loving family. Christian Assembly Berkshires is made up of a variety of people from many different backgrounds and cultures. Every Sunday we meet as a church, but throughout the week there are activities aimed at meeting the needs of kids, teenagers, and adults. Our vision is simple, helping people follow Jesus. Here, nobody's perfect. Beginners are welcome. Forgiveness is offered. Hope is alive. And it's okay to not be okay. We are everyday people looking to discover and experience the abundant life Jesus promised to anyone who would say yes to following him. Enjoy the message. Father, as we look to your word, would you give us ears to hear and a heart to understand what you would have for us in these next minutes. In Jesus' name, amen. So we come to the, just the final message of our Deny series. And I want to say again, our goal has been to bring understanding and, and clarity and encouragement to your follow life. That's what our goal has been. And so we launched with a very intense verse. And so I want to show you the verse. Jesus, walking to Jerusalem with his disciples, he turns to them. I don't know if they understood it all. And he says this, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And that's an intense, that's an intense statement from an intense God that's in the process of doing an intense thing because of your soul. Now we began this journey four weeks ago and I wanna remind you again, we put the verses up, I'm not gonna put them up today, but verses from God's word that clearly, clearly share that God has a plan and a purpose for your life to do you good and not harm. God has a clear purpose from Romans 8 uh, where he said, if God gave us Jesus, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? So he's a God that wants to give and, and give all things. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come unto me and you'll have rest. We clearly see that God, in God's plan and purpose for your life, there is blessing and peace and rest and abundance. So on top of that, Jesus gives this clarion call before he goes to the cross. And I believe we need to, uh, we, we cannot be afraid to wrap our arms around and say, show us what you mean because we trust you. So we've been talking about deny yourself and take up your cross, that kind of phrase, which again means this. It's a call to surrender to Jesus by determining to obey his will. And I've talked to you, you have to have both. The call to surrender or deny yourself is this, this passionate call where there's passion involved. God is a God of, of passion. Kevin read it in the, when he was reading from the Amplified Bible in 1 Corinthians, the affection but God is a God of a path, a practical path. So it isn't, it isn't just surrender myself to Jesus, amen. It's by determining to obey his will. And we looked at some verses. Let me go real quick before we close and get to today's um, insight with this. John 15, 10, Jesus said, if you love me, obey my commands. If you obey my commands, you'll live in my love. So this is a call of love. Galatians 5, 16. But I say, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill or gratify the desires of the sinful nature. This is, a call, this is the call to walk in the spirit. So if you look at what Jesus said and you look at his word, the call to deny yourself isn't just about pain and discipline. It's about love. It's about walking in the spirit. Later in Galatians 5, he said, those who belong to Christ Jesus, and I've talked to you about this. This is an ownership issue. Who owns you? Because he talked about walking in the spirit. He talked about the fruit of the spirit in Galatians 5, and we love that. Then after the fruit of the spirit, he says, you know, against such there is no law. And all those who belong to Christ Jesus, you have to decide. You can't just decide Jesus is great. Jesus is awesome. 
You have to make the decision, does he own you, right? That's even a strange thing to say because we live in a time and a space where no one owns anybody. We're all independent, and we get all that, but this is different. This is about your God. All those that belong to Christ Jesus, they've crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So we don't crucify our body. You don't literally take yourself, you don't go. He did that already. He went to the cross. That's what communion was about. He died and paid the price for your sin and your shame. And he's called us, though. What we crucify are those passions and the, those desires. When we just have those overflowing emotions and feelings, and then we just do what they say. We're, we've talked to you about to deny yourself and take up your cross it deals with the bending of the mind. We bend our mind towards the scripture. And then the scripture tells us what to do. And so we've been talking about that. And last week, we talked about that activity. If we can, if we can infuse this activity into our lives, God does a work. And it's called waiting on the Lord. We looked at this verse. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. Um, and he'll strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. We talked about the activity of waiting on the Lord, that the word wait means the twisting together of my will and God's word. That's what happens when you wait on the Lord. It's not just like you're waiting in a bank line, just try to wait with a smile. Waiting on the Lord, he's doing an inside work. Because if you're going to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow Jesus, that's an inside work. And so today I want to look at what Jesus preached before I send you out and you go buy your mother steak and lobster and then come to youth group and let her have some time by herself. I want to look at what Jesus preached. Because if we're to live this life, saved by grace, through faith, and then daily deny ourselves, because that's the call of the king, not only do we need understanding of what deny means, not only do we need the activity of waiting on the Lord, there are disciplines we need to work into our daily life. Because we don't drift towards deny self. We, we drift towards do what the self wants. But Jesus said, hey, listen, if you're going to follow me, you need to get me here. If you're going to be successful, as I have denied myself, I told the Father, not, you know, I, if there's a different way to go to the cross, but your will be done, not mine. So he modeled it. You know, and he went to the cross so he can say to us, you have your daily cross you need to pick up, that denying of yourself. So I want to talk to you today about the disciplines Jesus gave us because he doesn't just say things and leave. He gives us the power, the ability, and then the choice. These are the things, okay? So I want to take you to a sermon Jesus preached. Before I go there, though, I need you to see a few things. The first thing I need you to see is Philippians 2.13. God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. If, if denying yourself and taking up your cross means you have to crucify your passions and desires, God knows how hard that is. So he reminds you and lets you know he is working in you, giving you the desire. He'll give it to you, and he'll give you the power. God just doesn't give you the power to live well. He gives you the desire for those times when you say, Lord, I don't even have the want. I know, but I'm working in you. If you're born again and the Spirit of God lives inside of you, God wants you to know. I've, he knows what he's asked you to do. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. He knows what he's asked you to do, and he will enable you to do it. So I want you to see God says, I'm, I'm working in you, giving you this desire. This, is, this verse, by the way, connects with waiting on the Lord while you wait on the Lord. He does this inside work and transforms you. And you begin to say, you know what? I don't know if I'm going to do this, but I want to get up and read tomorrow. I want to. I want to pray. I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it. I haven't been able to do it yet, but something's happening. There's this hunger for this. I want to go to church, not I have to go to church. If you're here with your mom because you have to go, say amen. I, I, I'll see if I get a couple amens. Along with that, I want you to see this, 2 Timothy 4. Peter told, uh, Paul taught this to Timothy, and these are the days we're living in. He said, Timothy, a time is coming, and we're there, folks. 
when people will no longer listen to right teaching. You know why? Because they want to follow their own desire. See how important that is? If you don't tell your desire, it's going to be under the Spirit of God. It's going to tell you what it wants. And then when you get God's teaching, your desires are going to say, we don't want that. We want to follow our own desires. So we're going to look for teachers to tell us what we want to hear, not what God wants to tell us. And then what happens is you start following not Jesus, weird stuff. And in the church today, there's weird stuff. I see it online. And I know why there's weird stuff. Because of 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. People say, I don't want that teaching. That's for another generation. The Word of God, if you want to be relevant in culture, then know the Word of God. Because it's the only thing at the end that's going to be there. It mattered at the beginning, it matters now, and it'll matter at the end. But Paul was telling Timothy 2,000 years ago, listen, a time is coming. People don't want right teaching because they want to do what they want to do. So it's great to love instruction. It's great to want knowledge, but can you be corrected? That's what Proverbs 12 will, sell, will say. It says it's, it's great for someone to want knowledge. It's great to want instruction. Teach me and show me, but what if the teaching and the showing becomes correction? That's what he's talking about here. So you don't want to do that. You want to drink in right teaching even when it hurts. And it's about desire. That's why desires are very important. Don't let anybody tell you, God doesn't care how you feel. Oh, yes, he does. You can't let your feelings run the show, but he cares. Can you say amen? Last thing I need you to see, Hebrews 2.1. We must listen very carefully to the truth we've heard. Or we drift. You don't drift away from God because you're wicked or evil. You drift away from God because you're a human being. So he's saying you need to listen. Listen careful to the truth. It's the truth you've already heard. For almost every one of you today, I'm going to tell you something you've already heard. Some of you over and over and over again. But the writer of Hebrews is saying, listen carefully. The reason you're going to hear it for the umpteenth time is so you don't drift. Because we have a tendency to drift. So you don't drift away from the truth. Amen? Someone, someone said the definition of confusion is this. Multiple things pulling on the mind and the heart. And that's what the enemy is, the author of confusion. God is not the author of confusion. God does not throw multiple things at you. He throws one thing at you. One thing. He said it to Peter in John 22. He said, Peter, you follow me. That's what he throws at you. You follow. Peter was saying, what about John? Where's he going to go? And Jesus didn't answer him. He said, you follow me. Okay? So... I want to share with you today, Jesus preached disciplines of the deny yourself and follow me call. There are three disciplines. You know them, but I don't know if you've ever seen them from this perspective before. That's all. If you interject them into your life, your habit life, your regular life, these are things we need to get them somehow into our regular life. Into your, they will really help you with the intentional plan to deny yourself, because it doesn't happen naturally, does it? It's like you got to get up at 4 a.m. tomorrow. You better put your alarm clock on, because it's not going to happen naturally, is it? I know some of you are going to say, Pastor, I get up at 3:45 every morning. And so, but for the other 99.9% .9 of you, it's not natural. You're going to have to be like infused into that. So Jesus taught three practical disciplines. They can be applied daily, weekly, monthly. You have to wrestle with how they're going to be applied to your life. But they help keep yourself where yourself should be with Jesus. Because sometimes you have this, I'm going after God. And the thing in the way is, I just, I can't practice the things he's asked me to practice. So I've never positioned myself to, to, to do this. So you can find them in Matthew 6, 1 through 18. And I'm not going to go in depth, but I want you to see them. I want you to see these three disciplines, these three practices from a different perspective. From the perspective of how they connect to when Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Like I wanted you to see waiting on the Lord last week from a different perspective. Connect it to that life. I want you to see these three. Jesus, they're all Jesus taught. Uh, here's the first one. You can see it, Matthew 6, 3 and 4. But when you give to the needy, do not let your... 
your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. The first discipline to practice on regular basis is giving. I never get an amen on that. I go, whoo, yes, pastor. I was waiting. I didn't know what to do with my extra money. Have you ever heard that term? Extra money? Someone says that to me. I'm like, what's extra money? I've never had extra money. I've had money, but I've never had extra money. But we talk about this, right? We talk about tithing and giving and offerings. And I know it's a delicate subject. I've said that before because there's a lot of abuse out there uh, in the church. But Jesus said, listen, when you give, to do this, it's a sure way to deny yourself and take up your cross with your finances. And, and money drives a lot of things. And if you study the Bible, by the way, it is a very important part of, of the Bible. So if you're like, money is a very important thing. I don't care what you say. I, you're right. It is. As a matter of fact, the root of, uh, of evil is the love, the love of money, Jesus said. Not having a lot of money, but the love of money, attaching affection to money is the root, he said, of all evil. So if you, many people, this is an area of life they cannot wrap their head around. They cannot get disciplines in this area. So Jesus said, when you give, when you give, it's a practical thing. And, you know, people don't like people talking about money, but I want you to know God understands the world he put you in. So we've talked about, I did a whole, it'll come out soon. It'll come out, uh, you know, no one can, it was called. We took a whole Sunday. We talked about tithes and offerings and, and all of that stuff, the reasons and the why. But I want you to see it here in light of um, the call to deny yourself. You know, when you, you get that money, you tell your money, you're not in charge. God's in charge. So we're going to discipline you. Here's how we're going to discipline you. And there's that, that tithing, that givering, that, that generous spirit. Um, and just to be safe, because he knows our flesh, he says this, do it in secret. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, right? It's, that's a, a phrase. It doesn't really mean your hands know what they're doing. It means you don't, you don't come in today and say, oh, by the way, did you know how much I gave? Do you know what I gave? You know when you go somewhere and you give a big tip, they ring a bell? Don't have a spiritual bell. Don't do that. He's saying that doesn't mean no soul can know what you give. But it just means, secret means you're not out there to get any credit. You know it and he knows it. And he said, if you have that attitude, I will reward you openly. I will reward you openly. Amen? So I'm going to tell you a real quick story with this. It's not in my notes. Uh, I was so blessed by this story. It has to do with just God's heart with money and giving. There's a, a, a young man in college. You know, when you're in college, he, uh, he, he gives this testimony. He said every year he went to a, a Christian Bible college, a Christian college. He said every year at the end of the year, we'd have this big event with speakers and uh, worship. It was a great event. And so he was going to this big event. And he said, you know, I'm in college, so I live on ramen noodles and bread. And he had $5 in his bank account and, uh, you know, a college, college student life. And he goes to this meeting and he sits down and he's in the meeting and the worship and the things begin. And he said it was very, very powerful. And, and one of the people got up and begun to talk about how they support children in third world countries. And if you can support a child, you know, some of you I know do that. So much money a month, then the child gets food and clothes. And, uh, and they said it, it, it costs $38 a month. We have... I don't know, boxes for these kids. If, would you take a box? And, you know, and, and he's sitting there and he said, I felt this overwhelming conviction that I was supposed to do this. Overwhelming. You know, he said, Lord, I have $5 in my bank account to my name. And, and the speaker was like, you know, if you want to do this, what I want you to do is just raise your hand up right now. Lift your hand up if, if you're going to say yes to this. And so the, this college kid, he's wrestling. You know, and he's, he's telling the story. It's powerful. And he's like, oh, my goodness. And he, he had to just, yes, okay, you know. You know when God just does that? You're like, I, so he lifts his hands up high. No one had lifted their hand yet. And the guy says, oh, we got one up front. Amen. <laughs> and then he said, another kid, another kid. And hands started going up all over the place. He's like, all right, keep your hand up high. We're going to give out the boxes because they had the names of however many kids they had, 40 or 50. I don't know the number. So the, the, the college kid's got his hands closed. 
you know, his eyes closed, excuse me, and his hand up, you know, and they got their hands up, and he's waiting, and he's waiting, and the guy's like, just wait a few minutes, we're going to bring the boxes, each box is a kit for each kid, and he's going, I didn't get one, and I didn't get one, and I didn't get one, and I didn't get one, you know, he's like this, you know, and he didn't get one, and Finally, the guy speaking said, let's just give a round of applause. Can we just thank the Lord and praise all those? All of them have been taken. Praise the Lord. And the kid said, I never got one. And he put his hand down. And he said, the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, I don't need your resources. I need your obedience. And he said, my life was changed. Isn't that amazing? And so as we talk about the discipline of giving, I want you to know God doesn't need your resources, but he needs your discipline to obey him. Okay? That's the first discipline that ties into that call to deny yourself in a practical way. The second one is a few verses later, and I've preached on this verse. A few verses later, Jesus is still preaching. And he says, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who's unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you openly. If giving keeps our finances walking in the spirit, a regular prayer life keeps our flesh under the spirit by daily taking time to pray. So I put it to you this way. If giving is the way we surrender our money to God, a prayer life is the way we surrender our time to God. And I've talked to you about this. You have a whole, you have a, in this one verse, Jesus gave you all the secrets to a prayer life. I'll give you the four points again. Ready? Point number one. He said, but when? So when? When do you pray? You have to find out when you pray. Remember, I did this a few weeks ago. I said, you're going to pray at 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 6 a.m., 7 a.m. If you want a prayer life, number one, you've got to sit down and, uh, and this is when I'm going to pray. When? So when are you going to pray? If you don't figure out when, you're not going to grow a prayer life. When? Secondly, go. Where are you going to go? When that time comes to pray, where are you going to go? So there's a time and a location. See, Jesus is very practical. We love, we love the verse when I read it to you and Jesus said, My house shall be called, you finish it. Amen, pastor. Okay, well, when are you going to pray? Where are you going to go? And then he said, you know, into your room and close the door. Then you're just going to evaluate when and where you go. Does that really work for you? Does that work? And then point four is pray. Pray to your father. If you grow a prayer life, if you grow a prayer life, I'll t let me tell you, it'll go a long way into denying the... <laughs> The flesh, like he said, denying yourself and taking up your cross and following. Jesus told his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane with prayer, he said, listen, the spirit inside of you is willing. The issue is the flesh is weak, right? We all, we all know that. Um, and to daily take time, again, find a place, close the door, go and pray. And he said, it's a secret as well. Don't, don't wear a shirt, ask me about my prayer life. He said, just... No one, this is not about people knowing. Just grow that prayer life. And he, if you do, he said, I will reward you openly. The second discipline Jesus gives that will assist us in denying the flesh, which is what he said, and taking up the cross, which is what he said, and following him is a daily prayer life. Not a spotty when things go bad. Pray. Sure, when that happens, pray. Sure, pray you get all the green lights and it goes your way, but when are you going to have a, when are you going to stop and pray with him? That will tell your time you're not in charge. Because most of us, that's what we say, I don't have time. You have time. I've talked about this before. It's really connection to desire. So those are the first two disciplines. And you can see, you're like, ooh, pastor, ouch. I know they're ouch because they, you deny yourself. They're ouch for anybody. Everybody that says, nope, that's not ouch for me. I wish I didn't have to keep any money. I wish I just could pray 24-7. You're just deceiving yourself. You know that's not the truth. There is this thing in you. God is working in you, giving you the desire. There is this thing in you, right, that you're like, I, I want to give. I want to pray. Uh, I, I hear that all the time. And so I'm just telling you, if you can actually do them, this will, you're well on your way 
to that call to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. That's what he said. And then, you know, you don't like those two. You're going to hate the third one. A few verses later, here's the third discipline. Some of you know it because you know the Sermon on the Mount. We get down to Matthew 6. Again, it's the same, it's the same chapter of the Bible. One message. It's all red letter because Jesus taught this. I just want you to see it more. You know, sometimes when we see giving, we say, oh, that's for people that are blessed and have a lot of money. Prayer, well, that's for the pastor and those people. I'm telling you, no. This is for the person that says yes to following Jesus. We all have to have a giving, generous spirit. We all have to grow a prayer life. And here's the third one. Matthew 6, 16 to 18. Jesus said, when you fast, amen, thank you, brother. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their face uh, to show others they're fasting. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you fast... You see what he says? But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you're fasting, but only to the Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And other passages say will reward you openly. So here's the third discipline. I know it's hard. Regular fasting. This puts our appetite under the Spirit. If giving puts our money in the walk in the spirit, if a prayer life puts our time under, we're going to walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. Fasting puts our appetites, those things we, we, you know, we just love to eat. I know food is that physical eating, but you know what I mean. There's stuff beyond that. Now, biblical fasting is specific. If you want to fast social media, that's a good thing to do. But that's not biblical fasting. Biblical fasting is denying the body food for a certain amount of time for a spiritual purpose. To begin some kind of regular fasting, I'm telling you, it'll change your life. What do I do, pastor? How many? That has to be between you and God. He doesn't give rules like a prayer life. Do I pray five minutes, an hour? Two, I, I don't know what to tell you. Just start praying and the Spirit will lead you. Just get a when and a where, right? With your giving, just start. Start giving. Look, look, to the look to those things we said, but I don't know what to tell you. A meal a week? I know there are people that have come up to me and said, the doctor told me I cannot fast. I want you to listen to that spiritually. How would Jesus say when you fast, but then design you that you can't do it? So, Maybe you just can't not eat for two or three days or four days in a row because there's medical uh, things. That's certainly for sure, but there's a way you can fast. I know, I know that. I don't know what to tell you, so, but I know there's a way. And so this is what I'm telling you. You're asking me, so how do I begin? Well, maybe it's just a meal a week. Maybe Friday, Fridays I'm not eating lunch, and I'm going to go for a walk and pray, and I know why I'm doing it. Uh, I'm doing it because I want to obey Jesus' call when I fast. And I'm just telling my body, you're, you know, you're not in charge. You just don't get to eat every appetite you want. And you won't die because you miss lunch. And when you start to get a little headache, your head's going to be, oh, we're going to die. You're not going to die. Jesus isn't going to kill you. You will, you'll, you'll get food again. I know, you know, well, I, what if I'm shaky? What if I, I'm telling you, you'll make it. You'll make it. So maybe it's a meal a week you could start just to just get it in your life. Just begin to get it in. Maybe it's, it's two meals a week. Maybe you could do a, a sun up to sundown. I'm gonna fat, you do them in the winter, right? Because the sun goes down at about two in the afternoon, so you're good. If you do it coming up, you're going to be fasting until nine at night. You're looking at the clock. The sun's down somewhere, but it's just, I'm just giving you some suggestions because it's not about the rule and the law of it. It's about the spirit and the heart of it. And there is the action of the not eating, but it's about the heart and the attitude. Uh, maybe you could do one, one day a week. Okay, this day works for me. I'm, I'm going to fast. What would that look like? Maybe it's one day a month. I'm going to take this, I don't know, the last Saturday of every month. It's going to be just a day of fasting and prayer. I'm just not going to eat solid food. And I'm going to slow down so I don't have a lot of work to do. Because maybe you have a, a very busy job where you do a lot of work. So you have to think those things through for sure. But um, in it. it it isn't just not eating. It's understanding you're looking to do at least two things. Number one, obey the teachings of Jesus. Because he said, if you love me, obey. So it's to love Jesus. And number two, 
uh, you're telling your body its appetites that they're not in charge. The Spirit of God is in charge. And your appetites must also walk in the Spirit. And you trust God. He gives you good things, doesn't he? He's not a God to say, I never want you to eat again. I'm just going to give you bread and water. He's a God of the plenty. But there's a time and a season for everything. Ecclesiastes tells us that. Um, and, and it's also to be done in secret. You don't want to wear a shirt, I'm fasting today. And again, secret doesn't mean if, if another person knows, it doesn't matter. It just talks more of the attitude of what you're doing. So, you know, comb your hair and have mouthwash and, you know, with you. And don't, I'm all disheveled and pour dirt on your hands and go to work and say, I'm fasting. So I, you know, Jesus is like, you need to stop. You don't understand what I'm talking about. Um, so regular giving, praying, and fasting, right? This isn't like a, whoa, but these are three disciplines that Jesus taught us. Remember what Hebrews 2 said, listen carefully to the truth you already know, or else you drift from it. Take up your cross and follow Jesus, right? It's a great, uh, wow, what a speech it can be in a, in a sermon. And, and if you're good at those things, you stir up passion. But these are, these are, this is the practical pathway there. They remind us that we do have the power. I'm working in you giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases me. That's what he said in Philippians. He's working in you. If he's asked you to do these things, he's working in you so you can do them. This, these things. And everybody's different, so they do look different. Just be careful of it. It has to be like brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. I want to be careful about that too. It doesn't. You don't have to do it exactly the way I do it. We're not even the same people. You may be in a, a, a different season of your life. You may have some medical things that are different or life's different or uh, your age, wherever you may be. But I'm telling you, take these to the Lord because he gave them to all all of us. And one of the reasons he gave them to you and me was to say, I'm calling you to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. And, and you're going to need to apply these things uh, to your life. And with all three of them, you saw motive matters. You know, so I want you to know as your pastor, I practice all three of these. I would not just, I'm going to preach these to you. I've done them for years. All three of them on a regular basis. Um, giving, prayer life, fasting. All three of them on a regular basis. I don't just fast once a year in the January fast time. I regularly have fasting. A, a daily prayer life. A tithing and offering of giving of my weekly, whatever, m monthly checks. To do that, I want you to know I practice that. And I, Pastor, you're not doing it in secret. Well, I'm, I'm trying to now, as my position as your pastor, to let you know that uh, I do these in my life. They're hard. And sometimes I'm not doing real well. But I know I'm going to continue to do them. And I can give you then, from my testimony, I have been abundantly rewarded from my God for all of these. And I want you to know this. I don't do them to get saved. I don't do them to get saved. I'm saved by grace through faith, that not of works, lest David McIntosh would boast. I'm saved by the cross. I do not do them to get saved. I do not do them to get Jesus to love me more. I know he loves me as much as he can already love me because he gave his son. God gave his son. I don't do it to get Jesus to love me more. I don't even do it to manipulate God to do things for me. I haven't eaten a whole meal today. You need to answer my prayer. I don't do it for that either. I simply do it as a motivation to humble myself because I need to be humbled daily. And sometimes it does blow my mind. I would think after 31 years, my flesh would be more spiritual and it isn't. The spirit in me is growing stronger. The spirit gets stronger and stronger as I'm following Jesus. But my flesh, it's still my flesh. It still wants what it wants to do. It never wants to fast, ever, not once. If you say, I'm gonna wait till my flesh tells me I'm in agreement to fast, you can forget that. My flesh tells me why it deserves to eat. 
at midnight, at 3 a.m., at 8 a.m., when my team wins, when my team loses, when my team's not playing. So don't wait on your flesh. You tell your flesh, Jesus said, and I don't even have the the strength to do this, but he's going to give me the strength, and I want to inject these into my life, not to get saved, not to get God to love me, not to manipulate God to do things, because I want to humble myself and obey the call to follow and hear what Jesus said. And, you know, I could go on now all afternoon and share with you the overwhelming blessings that this is how I could share with you the times I'm like a little baby complaining because I don't want to do any of them. And that was like two weeks ago, not 20 years ago. But I can tell you, Jesus has honored me over and over and over again. Not because of perfection or flawlessness of it, but the hunger to say, I want to do this. Help me. I want to fast because my appetites. Are... I tell my flesh when I fast and it gets hungry. You're not the boss. Jesus is the boss. You're not going to die. But we're going to eat. I tell my money. I've looked at money before. Is this on tape? You're not the boss. I'm tithing you. Now be quiet. And I've said it about my time in prayer life. I've gotten up early in the morning and I didn't want to get up and I go to prayer. And I'm like, Lord, I I want to start off by saying, I don't want to be here. I'm tired of this and I have a headache. But you're worthy. I got nothing to offer. There'll be no great prayer going up here. I'm just here. I got nothing to offer, but you're worthy. You're worthy of all of my time. So here I am. And then I've had times when it's been glorious. But these disciplines, I'm telling you, Jesus just doesn't turn and say, follow me. He says, listen, I want to give you the playbook. I want to give you the secrets how you're going to do this. Because your flesh doesn't want to and the stinking enemy doesn't want you to. But I will be working in you. And I will be giving you the power and the desire to do this. And I will manifest myself in the midst of this. But I want this to become part of your practical everyday life. Amen? I close with a verse. I want to close with this verse. Paul wrote this at the end of his life to to Timothy. In 2 Timothy 4. He's in, I believe, in prison when he wrote it. You scholars can check me, or he just got out, or I think he was in prison, but I'm not 100% sure as I sit here. But, but young Timothy's right, a protege, and he's coming up, and he says this. He writes this to Timothy. He says, as for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race, and I've remained faithful. I love this because he's honestly writing to Timothy and God knows you and I are going to read it. And he starts out by saying, as for me. He's just talking about me. And you may have a ton of responsibilities in your life and you may be responsible for many other people as you sit here right now. But I want you to know the day is going to come and it's going to come quickly and you're just going to stand before God and it's just as for me. He's just going to ask you about you. That's how this world tries to confuse us and make it complex. It just resp- and all that Paul did and all the churches uh, he started and everywhere he went and how we talk about him today. At the end of his life, he had the end of his life like you and I will have the end of our life. He says, Timothy, as for me, my life. That's one of the things you need to do when you take time waiting on the Lord. Just think about you and your life, who you are, where you are. What does God want to do? As for me and my life, because he's coming near death here. It's already been poured out as an offering to God. Is that your perspective? Do you go after God so God can just fill your life with blessing? Or do you come, do you have those times when you come and say, God, I know my life doesn't seem like much, but... I want to pour it out for you. I want to pour it out. That's how my flesh sounds when I say we're fasting. When I hear a crying baby in church, you know what I think? Praise God. This baby's here. There's kids here. 
if that throws you for a loop, you're in the wrong church. I don't know what to tell you, but I bring them on. I know they spill their Cheez-Its or your Cheez-Its, right? You're on your phone going, I can't believe that kid has a Cheez-It. I'm up here going, can I have a Cheez-It? What are you doing on your phone? As for me and my life, it's already being poured out. And I just want you to know, this is a Mother's Day verse. Because after uh, the teas and the dresses and the hats and the flowers, I have a mother and I've watched a mother. You want to learn how to pour your life out for somebody else with nobody knowing about it? Sit down with a mom. The second they get that test back and it's positive, they have a fresh purpose. You talk to any mom, the goods, the bads, whatever. Everything changes. And then, when that baby's in her arms, I was there when the first one was in her arms. And I saw I no longer was the love of her life. (laughs) It took about three seconds. And little Miss Rebecca knocked me down a peg. And then I kept going down. And there's something about it that's right. There's something about it that's right. Moms know what it's like to pour themselves out for others. Maybe your mom, maybe you don't have a great mom story in your life. I don't know about that. Uh, And the Lord bless you. I know, I know it can work. I know there can be a lot of pain on these mothers and fathers' days. But Paul said, I poured, I poured myself out like an offering. He connected to Jesus saying, listen, Paul, you're going to have to deny yourself. Deny yourself becomes easier once in your DNA, your spiritual DNA, you get that purpose. Jesus died for me. I follow him, everything changes. And that's what I mean. You could see it in a mom's eyes. When that baby's born, there's a fresh purpose. That's why they say, don't get in the way of a mother bear. Have you ever done that? I have as a second grade school teacher. I would rather face your father than your upset mom. Because they they do not stop. And they will take you down day by day, day by day. But moms do that in a good way too. That's why I know we we wanted to pray for answered prayer. And then he says this, and I close. Kev, if you're here, could you come up? Then he says this. The time has come for my death. Got a text yesterday morning from my mother. David, I just want you to know, Uncle David, my Uncle David died. I got this yesterday morning. I mean, he wasn't doing well. But I just got that text yesterday morning. I mean, death is coming. Paul was like, the time of my death is near. It's like he dealt with that. He knew that. He didn't know the day or the hour, but he knew it was coming. I don't mean to be morbid, but if you want to take up your cross and follow Jesus and deny yourself, you need those right times to think about the day we're all gathered in here and you're not here. We're gathered here to remember you. You shouldn't focus that on your whole life. Live your life, but you need to take those moments like Paul did. He said, listen, I know what's happening. And then he said this incredible verse. Because he's followed Jesus. You know, since that Damascus road. He did not say the time of my death is here. Oh my goodness. Jesus has just set me up. What an easy tiptoe through the tulips this has been. I've done everything right. So it has just been uh, incredible. I don't have one scar. One, if you do this right, Timothy, you won't have one bit of pain. He doesn't say that at all. He says, I fought. I fought. 
It is a fight. You are at war. There's an enemy out there, and there's a world out there that does, does not want you, child of God, in their business. And Paul got it. And he told Timothy, I fought the good fight. I don't know how else to tell you, but it's a fight. Ask mom. She'll tell you. It's a fight. I don't mean this fight. I mean this fight. It's a fight. Paul said, I, I fought the good fight. I finished. I finished. Paul knew, Paul knew it wasn't how you started. It's how you finish. I remain faithful. That's what he told Timothy. He didn't say, I did it perfect. I didn't make any mistakes. But I fought. I'm going down fighting, Timothy. My death is coming soon, and spiritually, I'm swinging all the way to the last breath. I'm swinging. And I'm fighting the good fight. The word good's important. The fight God's called you to fight. We don't fight flesh and blood, right? Powers and principalities. Not one another. And I finish the race. You know what the word fight means there? In the original Greek? It means a conflict that happens to you while you're in the contest. Or while you're in the race. So while you're participating in the race or the, the con, or, or you're participating uh, in, the, in the contest or the race, while you're doing it, conflict comes up. While you're mothering, while you're fathering, while you're just living life, you're living the race, you're trying to be the Christian God's called you to be, and conflict still comes. So what do you do? Quit? You fight. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. He didn't even say, I won. He said, I fought the good fight, and I finished. And I know I didn't finish it, but he says after this, I'll paraphrase, going home. I'm going home. It's time for me to go home. That you can be rest assured about. That's what Jesus says right now. Didn't he say that? I'm preparing a place for you. Don't worry about where you're going. Fight the good fight. I know there's conflict to pray and give and fast and follow Jesus. To Paul said, I, he knows there's conflict, but it is a fight. Don't quit. If anyone would come after me, let him take up his cross. Deny himself and come. That's the call. That's your call out of the world. Right? With the blood dripping out here, out of his side, come. I have your purpose. I have your life. I, but I just want you to know, it's going to be a fight. I can tell you this, the fight for me has created purpose. I know why I'm here. I never knew before. To goof off or what? To make money and die? When I got born again, I found out I was here. I had a purpose. I had a king. I had a savior. And he had a plan for me. That's what it'll do. Don't be afraid. It'll create purpose. Just like when that baby gets in that mom's hands. Purpose. Love. I want to invite you to stand. This is how I want to close. I don't want this to be super long. Or I'm you know, trying to do any of those things, but here's how I want to close. We've done this series. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. If, if I want to just encourage you again as, as we're getting ready to leave. 
that, that activity of waiting on the Lord from last week. These three disciplines, seeing them from a new perspective, how do they fit into your life? And you don't have to be anybody else's fasting life, anybody else's praying life, and anybody else's giving life, just your own. You get with God and say, let's start doing this. How do we do this? Some of you have never done these things before. Some of you, they got rusty, right? And some of you, you're just motivated and encouraged to say, I, I know afresh and anew why I'm doing this. So you can tell your flesh, this is why we're doing this. I have a, I have a plan. I'm going somewhere. And I'm going to fight the good fight. That's why it's important to come to church. See, the people around you, they understand they're fighting the good fight. Your fight. We're fighting the same fight. That's why we need each other. That's why we need to come. Say, these people get it. I know they get it because they're here. I know they call us weird. We're just weird because we're fighting a different fight. They were just weird because they don't get us. Well, some of us are weird, but they're weird because they don't get us. That's okay. So this is what I want to do. I want to open these altars up for this, and I want to pray over you. If you want to come to this altar and just take a step to say, hey, pastor, I'll take that prayer. I want to pray over you. I want to pray with you for strength to fight your good fight. For God to encourage you, invigorate you. And if you need to, if you're dealing with sin in your life because you just haven't gotten over it, you don't leave and say, well, when I get rid of the sin, then I'll fight the good fight. You've been duped. That's part of the fight <laughs> your whole life. So you just come up here and say, Lord, I'm going to fight the good fight. So you fight sin by saying, I repent. Fill me, show me. Or maybe there's other things in your life. Maybe you've got depression, anxiety. You're just angry and offended and all, you know, all that stuff. That's all the stuff. The flesh, the world, and the enemy gets in there to confuse you. But you've heard again today from the word of God. He has called you. Fight the good fight. Finish. Finish. I want to just pray a blessing over you, a blessing over this church that we would be reinvigorated with this call. Yes, to deny ourselves. Yes, to take up these disciplines, but this clarion call to fight the good fight and not be afraid to pour out our lives for the King.